this uh, point, let me uh, stop sharing my screen and I will let you, uh, Leila, introduce yourself. If you can give us uh, your story and tell us um, your background and, uh, and, your, uh, and your experience. Of course. First off, thank you so much for the invite to be here today. I love helping people out, especially in a forum like this where anyone can tune in and get any advice or questions they have answered. I think this is a wonderful service uh, that you and your company are bringing. And a little bit about myself. So I don't have any slides prepared, but my name is Leila Kanada. Um, if you've heard of me before, you might know me by my previous name, Leila Hawana. Um, my name recently changed. But what I am is I am a machine learning engineer at Intel. Um, I have had that particular title since the beginning of this year, so almost for a full year now. Um, but my path to getting here was very sideways and not straightforward. So um, I have been in the field of computer science for about three years. And before that, I was a professional soloist musician. So my undergraduate degree is in percussion performance with a specialty in marimba, which is like a really big xylophone. And I used to travel the nation playing uh, solos and duets and a bunch of small ensembles, as well as recording YouTube videos, competing in competitions, um, and et cetera. And then Alongside of that, I also have a bachelor's degree in mathematics, which I got at the same time as my bachelor's degree in music performance. Um, I finished my undergraduate degree in 2015, and then about a year into doing that and being a full-time musician and prepping for a PhD, I decided that I wanted a career shift and I switched into computer science. And so that started in about 2016 for me, so about three years ago. And I started from scratch and built all of my knowledge in coding, all of my knowledge in software development, and all my knowledge in machine learning over the last few years. And I graduated with my master's degree from Portland State University in 2018. And now I work at Intel. And in that time, I had also done some interning at Intel uh, with the same group that I'm working with now, technically as a software development engineer, but really doing this machine learning work. And I also was teaching courses at the university and I still do that now, even graduated as an adjunct professor. And so now I am here and I know there are probably lots of questions as to what I've done and how I've gotten here. And I'm happy to answer what comes next. Thank you, uh, Leila. So I guess you're still um, I'm sure you're still playing music then, or is this something that you're kind of uh, putting on the side for now? Oh, no, definitely something I do. I've had a little bit of an injury the past few months, so I haven't been doing as much. But before that, I was playing at local theaters, um, at, at theater companies. I was competing in competitions, and I was also just playing for fun and teaching lessons. Great, great. So how about, um, I guess, a question that I think a lot of uh, uh, people here from uh, the audience, I'm sure they would uh, like to know more about, especially for uh, when you work for a big company like uh, Intel. I'm sure a lot of people would be curious to learn about what a typical day as an ML or machine learning engineer would, um, would look like. Yeah, so it's a little bit what you would not expect. Um, I can't say this is true for other companies, but definitely at Intel, you do take an entrepreneurship role, which makes it pretty fun. And as a machine learning engineer, it varies from team to team. But for my team, I am part-time a software developer for them to be able to learn their product and learn their domain. So that way I can be successful at the other half of my job, which is finding and taking problems in the domain and finding machine learning solutions for them or telling them when they have machine learning solutions not to do so because it might overcomplicate the problem or there's not enough data or it's too risky or anything like that. Um, and then based off of 
whichever direction we go, usually the machine learning route is what I focus on, then we have to be able to prove business value, find funding, as well as develop the algorithms, collect the data, analyze the data, um, determine everything we need, um, create proof of concepts, and then sell that to upper management. And then once that's done, we get to um, fully flesh it out and put it into production. And so right. on a day-to-day, -day, I might have two or three different machine learning projects that I'm juggling at different stages, um, but I also will have some of that software development work to make sure that I'm understanding the foundations of the product that my team works on to find more problems in the domain to solve. Okay. And can you tell us what uh, very quick has been uh, your uh, most fun, I would say, project so far? Uh, yeah. So uh, one that I've been working on for a while now, and I think this one is one of the ones that's closest to me because it was the first one that I've worked on and has been going for with the most success so far, is um, a project that we have that allows you to detect what a user is doing on their machine at any given time without using any personal information. So all it uses is telemetric data, like how much of your CPU you're using or how many network packets were sent or how many thread blocks have you used. And based off of those types of information, we can tell if you're playing a game or watching a movie or um, doing checking email. And so based off of that, the product that I work for, the team that I work for, um, can adjust power settings and thermal settings so that you get the best experience with what you're doing. So we can change it on the fly. Sounds like a lot of, uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, question here from uh, Faiz. Uh, how much important is data structure and algorithm for a carrier and Intel as a, machine, as a machine learning software engineer. So is that question asking how important is it to know it or how important is it to use it? Uh, let's assume that it's uh, how much important. It doesn't really say, so I would okay. say, yeah. I'll assume then how much, how important it is to know about it. That seems to be usually more of a common question. Mm -hmm. And what I would say there is it's extremely important to know data structure and algorithm structure um, on a fundamental level. Because when you are faced with these problems when you're here at Intel, really most of the time you're placed on a team and you are probably the only machine learning engineer, or maybe there's one or two others you can collaborate with. And you're surrounded by people who maybe um, enjoy looking into machine learning as a hobby, um, but are not trained in it. And you need to be able to take a problem and understand every tool in your toolbox to be able to come up with a solution. And if you don't have a very solid foundation of data structure, a very solid foundation of algorithms, a very solid foundation of how what to do with data that you collect and how to improve results, um, you are not going to be as successful coming up with these solutions or it will take you a lot longer. So understanding those fundamentals with software development structures in terms of data structures, the actual structure of your data and the machine running algorithms is crucial. Okay, we got actually a follow-up question from someone else, uh, mm -hmm. somewhat related. Uh, so still, how much important is data structure and algorithms uh, for a carrier? This time it's in cloud, DevOps and Hadoop and Hadoop uh, developers. For developers? Yeah. Um, so knowing data structures and algorithms as a developer is also extremely important um, for at least the interview process, if not for your actual job. What most people find is that when they interview, they need to know their algorithms and data structures. And what you're going to be testing on in your interview is most likely what you're going to be using in your job. That is the reason they ask you those questions in the interview. So you might go to one interview and you'll get a question about a binary search tree and you'll go into another interview and get a question about virtual functions. And you might feel like, you know, it's a lottery what they're asking, but the reason they're asking these things is because that's what you'll be working on. And so as a minimum, you need to understand these to get through the interview processes to land the job. And then once you're in the job, um, if you don't have these fundamental um, data structures down or these algorithms down, when it comes time to say work on the project and you need to modify one of these structures, yes, you may not be needing to create it from scratch anymore, but you need to know it's internal so you know what to fix or what to work on and develop.
So still very important as a software developer too. Okay, uh, how about resume parsing? Uh, Navin Shoulder is asking. Mm -hmm. Like how, as an interviewer, we parse a resume? Yes. Okay, so I will um, talk about this first with the disclaimer that I personally, in the interview process, I run lots of interviews. I do not usually do the parsing of resume part though. Usually if a resume has come to me, it's because an interview is scheduled and it's time to run the interview. So when I look at interviews, it's more like, okay, who am I about to talk to rather than am I qualified to pass them on to the next level? Um, with that in mind though, when I do look at a resume, if I'm impressed or like something I would consider as a really good resume, what I'm looking for is the resume that tells a story. And so a lot of times recruiters will say, put keywords, um, will list your most important stuff at the top, do the highlights. And all of those are really important because as we're reading through lots of resumes, we don't necessarily have a lot of time. However, um, with that said, you don't wanna skimp on something that tells your story and some of the most important colorful parts of your story. So a lot of times I see things that are like, have my master's degree in computer science um, from this university with this GPA, have been working at these five or six companies doing different kinds of roles. Um, and then I might see a list of keywords and that will be it. And while that's a resume that says, hey, I'm qualified, it doesn't tell me much about the person. Um, versus if I see a resume that says, hey, I got my degree from these schools and the GPA, and maybe I got these awards or volunteered with these communities, that tells me like, oh, okay, they're taking a part in control of their education, not just getting their degree. And then when I go look at their work experience, I might see that they've had 10 years at the same company, but I can see a little bit of different projects that they've worked on. Um, and so I can ask about those and see how passionate they were about those projects or not. Um, a lot of things that really stand out too are personal projects that end up on your resume because that shows what you're truly interested in and what you keep working on, whether they're successful or not. Um, it gives us something to talk about and see what you're really interested in a lot more than those keywords will. Um, so those are the types of things that help form your story, as well as um, information you may not think is relevant. So a friend of mine just posted a blog post on LinkedIn about how being a barista actually helped her on her resume rather than hurt. A lot of people told her to take that experience off. But really what it did is it showed that she had exposure and different skills, that she was taking advantage of her education by working during the same time. Um, but it also gave her skills that a lot of other people don't have. For me with my music background, um, even though it's not relevant, I still put it as one of my degrees that I've achieved. And it brings in a lot of questions because I have a lot of experience presenting, um, preparing materials, teaching, all of that, that a lot of other people don't have. And so telling that story is crucial with a resume. Okay, since we're, um, that's, that's a great uh, answer. And that's, uh, I think not, I would say, probably applicable just to an ML um, software engineering role. I think uh, being able to tell a story on your resume, I think you can apply that to almost any, any, any job because it tells more than just what your skills are, but who who, who you are and obviously, you know, companies are not hiring, you know, robots, they're hiring people. So they need to know, you know, who's behind, uh, who's behind that resume. Uh, having said that, so besides uh, that, besides those um, things that, you know, we just uh, talked about that uh, um, employers are looking for in a resume, in terms of skills, what are your top three, five skills you think that are crucial uh, to land an ML uh, software engineer role? Um, I would say the, and these are some things that might come through on a resume, but usually come through in an interview process more. Um, you need to have problem solving skills. Um, that is probably number one. Like, um, and then a close second is your foundations and algorithms and foundations and data analysis. Um, and those are the top three because without those, you cannot be successful in your job, especially if you are the only person on your team doing your job. And so what that looks like is usually when I'm trying to poke at this in an interview, I will ask some kind of problem solving question like pretend you own a restaurant and um, you want to create an algorithm to determine the amount of time it takes 
for a food order to get delivered from the time they give the order to the time it's ready to be delivered. Um, and I might say like, okay, what features do you want to do this? Or we might expand on it after that. And what that's really doing is not telling me, if, hey, you know an algorithm, but can you take a problem and look at it from 10 or 15 different levels? Can you see the high level important things that you need to know, the low level important things, um, the mid level important things and everything in between. And so that shows your problem solving skills um, as well as um, also your algorithm skills because you need to know what's important. You can't just tell me collect anything and everything because that's a fundamental flaw in machine learning algorithms. You can't collect that much and so what um, those are like the three things that are probably the most important. And then aside from that, um, if there's any projects or experience you have, looking for those to land a role is also really important because it shows us that, hey, you're not just theoretically competent, but you're also practically competent. Okay, thank you, uh, Leda. Um, question, I guess, a follow-up question since we're still talking about uh, interviews, something that I hear a lot, um, I have, I'm not saying that question yet, but I think I'm sure it will come up, is um, resources and, and tools essentially that someone can use to prepare for the interview, for the job, for, you know, mm -hmm. anything you would recommend as far as uh, resources and, and tools? Um. I don't have any particular sites or resources in general. And the reason I do this, it's the same thing I do when I teach is that um, it's going to be different for every person. Um, everyone has a different learning style. And with that, the way that they absorb the material will be different and the value that they get out of the material will be different. With that said, a couple that work well for most people are the, um, like the Stanford Intro to Machine Learning classes, as well as the MIT ones. Those are usually free courses you can take online and go over the fundamentals of the algorithm. Um, there are also a couple books of just interviewing questions. Um, a quick Google search for common machine learning interview questions will get you pretty far as well in terms of what's being asked and what to prepare. Um, but in terms of preparing for an interview and having those materials, any courses that you've taken, re-going through those um, and just really making sure you understand those theoretical fundamentals um, and can answer problems about them, can answer um, questions about basic vocabulary. It will take you a long way. Hello? Oh, sorry, I was oh. now. No worries. Mute. Um, so what is the uh, what is the interview uh, like? Is there like a typical uh, interview that uh, um, someone need to uh, be prepared to uh, uh, to to crack? So there's no really typical interview process because um, machine learning engineers are very popular right now. Everybody wants them. Everybody says they want a PhD machine learning engineer with 10 years of research, even though that's probably not what they're going to be getting or really wanting. Um, it really varies and depends on the product you're working on. So um, I interviewed with a company before accepting Intel that was doing deep learning for um, image processing with autonomous vehicles. And when I was talking with them about the interview process and everything, all of their questions were based around, can I um, program a convolutional neural network? Do I know the foundations of a convolutional neural network? And what do I know about deep learning? Um, which made sense because again, that is the product that they're working on. So I had to prepare a lot of deep learning convolutional neural network knowledge to be prepared for that interview. I went to another interview and their projects focused more on reinforcement learning. So naturally their questions were focused more around reinforcement learning um, as well as some of the basic fundamentals. Um, on my team, we do a lot of supervised learning. So a lot of times we'll ask questions based around different supervised learning techniques um, as well as data analysis, which is really critical on our team as well as how well can you analyze data and solve, use that to solve a problem. And so there really is no one set of problems for interviews. I mean, other than just knowing your fundamentals and knowing 
what algorithms do what and what they're best used for. But if you really want to prepare for an interview and interview questions, you need to research the company, find out what their product is about. And based off of that, you can get a pretty good guess as to what you should be studying for for that interview. Okay, great. Um, I think someone had a question about um, how to get an ML job. I think he used uh, Google, but Intel, uh, I'm sure would be as uh, challenging and as difficult to, uh, I don't know if it would be the same process, but we could use that, I think, as, as, uh, as a good example also, since it's also a top tech company. So um, feel free to share as much as you can, but what essentially helped you get a job uh, as an ML engineer at uh, Intel? Yeah, so this is probably a little bit unusual, but I got my job by um, creating it for myself. So like I said, I was an intern for this team before as a software development engineer, and that's exactly how I came in. And by the end of my first summer internship, so three months in, I had told them like, hey, you know, my interest is in machine learning. I see your product. Are there ways that this is a way I feel like we could improve it with machine learning that would help the overall structure and save a lot of code, save a lot of time and space and be beneficial. And coincidentally on that team, they said, oh, hey, you know, we had been thinking about machine learning the last couple of years, but never acted on it because we have no one with the experience. So go ahead, give your pitch. We'll see where it goes and um, take it from there. And so the last month or so of my internship was purely focused on designing that solution. And then he invited me back the next summer. So nine months later, after being in school, I came back and found out they were working on trying to continue with that idea and had sprouted some other ideas on their own. And my role that that entire summer was, hey, pick up with your idea. Let's see what we can do. So I was still hired technically as a software development engineer, but all I was doing was machine learning research and data science for them. And I was helping them with their other projects. I was helping with their coworkers to understand what they're doing to try to improve their processes. And by the end of that summer, we had been presenting it, asking for funding. We had a proof of concept. We had um, a plan to get it into production. We had a plan to, um, combine it with other products. We had started thinking about future problems that we wanted to solve, how that could help with future problems. And um, then by the time that was over and I started my job, um, they were like, hey, we want to hire you on full time when you graduate, which was in January for me. And um, they had said, we want to bring you on as a software developer. And I had said, well, all the work I'm doing is as a machine learning engineer. Can I be brought on as a machine learning engineer? And they had no problem with that. And we had the expectation that, yes, I'd be doing some software development, but my job role would be as a machine learning engineer. And as those um, projects come up, or as we create more of those projects that I would be on them. And so I essentially created that position for myself from finding a need in a different position that I got. Um, and this is probably some of the most successful people I've seen in getting these jobs is not going after the jobs that everybody wants. Um, it's about finding where the need is and trying to help out as much as possible. And that's where people have been the most successful. With that said, there's lots of machine learning engineering jobs. Um, most of them post that they're looking for PhDs and that they're looking for 10 years experience and that they need to come solve the, all the problems of the world, even though in reality, there might be small problems. So if you can make those network connections, talk with people, provide suggestions, think about these problems on your own and maybe help come up with solutions, whether or not they're problems they've been thinking about or not. That's when they're gonna see that, oh, you do have the skills and expertise we need, even though maybe you haven't matched our job description or we haven't posted a job or you're coming in earlier than we thought, um, let's consider you know, offering a job to you or talking to you more, or interviewing you. And so creating those connections and solving those problems and finding those problems on your own is a lot more helpful in finding a job successfully than applying to posts that you may see. That's a great answer, Leila, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, switching gears a little to uh, students here who are going to uh, graduate um, soon. What can they uh, do now 
uh, to prepare for an ML uh, software engineer role? Um, refresh your fundamentals, know your fundamentals, keep up on research papers, do projects and connect with people in the field. Those are the five main things that will be extremely helpful alongside the normal job hunting process. But those are the things that are going to keep you up to date, help you have informed conversations and help you solve problems. And if you can demonstrate those skills in those interviews that you're getting called to and you can show that you have this passion or interest for machine learning, it's gonna take you a long way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, professionals? Uh, so uh, essentially someone who's already uh, not necessarily in that field, but who has you know, a few years of experience, how easy or how difficult would it be for someone with a different background other than ML uh, to get into, into a role like, like yours? Um, it's hard, but it's not impossible. The reason I say that is if you are a professional and you're trying to switch directions, you have a lot less time to study than someone who's a student and studying this full time. So already you're at a disadvantage. You just don't have as much time in your day when you're working 40 hours a week. With that said, it is possible and I see a lot of people do it. And what it takes is taking those classes, um, learning your fundamentals and doing a lot of projects to apply them on your own. and Within a couple of years of doing that and reading papers and staying on top of everything, you will be just as prepared as someone else who's been in school to take on a job, which also means transferring. But then you have a little bit more of an advantage if you're transferring, let's say, within the same company, because you've already shown that you work really well for them in one role and you're wanting to take on another role because of interest change. So you've already built that rapport with them and you already have that um, that reputation within your company. So then if you can say like, hey, I have these skills, I want to do this job instead. I have proven that I am already doing my job well in this other role. They are more likely to pick you over someone else that they've never worked with or does not have a reputation with them. So while it is harder, um, it does make it a little bit easier to find a job, especially within the same company, once you do develop those skills. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Leila. Mm -hmm. Um, another question here, um, as far as um, uh, keeping up with, uh, I guess, the industry, uh, since I'm sure it's evolving at uh, the speed of light, almost the speed of light. Um, yeah. what, uh, how do you, uh, what do you do? Is there anything you do uh, on a regular basis to keep yourself uh, up to date? Talk to people and read papers cannot emphasize that enough. Um, when I was in graduate school, I joined a reading group and we just met up once a week and we read through a paper together and we answered questions on it and then literally did that every week. And I've tried to keep that up on my own as well, being out of school, um, sometimes doing a couple a week, finding things that I'm interested in or I'm interested in seeing how it's progressed and continue to do that. Going to conferences is also fun, to, a fun way to do that as well, but it's also expensive, um, cannot always be very affordable. And so as a default, reading papers all the time is going to keep you up to date because those papers are what's being published. Okay, great. Uh, what uh, did you wish you knew during your application process for Intel before you, before you applied? Any surprises there? Um, there weren't really any for me, but that's because I also had the unusual luck of the fact that my husband now um, worked at Intel, my father works at Intel, and I have about three or four friends at that time that also worked at Intel. So I knew everything about the interview process um, from the very beginning and how to get my application found and how to succeed through all of that. So for me, there weren't any tips that like I wish I had, but some of the tips I was thankful I had was um, the practice and knowing how to answer some of these behavioral questions. Um, and going through that first. A lot of times we all think those are the easy questions, the things we don't have to prepare, but thinking through those before getting into a high pressure situation and going with what your gut says was extremely helpful. Um, and it helped me understand what I was getting into and how I should be acting when I get into that role. So for example, one of the most helpful ones was, um, let's say you're working on a project and 
you find out all of a sudden that something has to be done tomorrow and you had plans to go to a concert or something that you've had planned for like six months and or you have your family's birthday party that evening and you can't get it done but someone's telling you you have to get this done what do you do um, a lot of people will say well I'll just stay and get it done um, or I'll reschedule or I'll skip the concert because that's not as important as my job but in reality what you need to do is you need to have that conversation with whoever is doing it and say this is what I can do this is what I cannot do um, if I do get this done this is what I'm going to be sacrificing and I am not okay with this um, if it's really important you explain to me how important it is I will make the decision to get it done but in the future this cannot happen again and having that conversation is really setting your ground to say that no you cannot take advantage of me and my time versus where someone coming in that would just say oh I'll get it done I'll miss this concert this time but I'm sure there will be others and not having that conversation is setting yourself up to be taken advantage of with your time and so having thought through those behavioral questions that we will get ahead of time was a huge huge lifesaver for me, not in terms of just the interview, but also in terms of learning how to navigate these difficult situations. That's a great answer. Thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Ada. Uh, question here, uh, which certification is best for career as a machine learning? Do you have any like certification you would recommend uh, to take? I don't. Um, for me, when it comes to looking at all of those certifications, all that tells me is that you took a course or learned this material. So um, personally, as someone who's recruiting, I don't really care if you're certified or not. What I care is, do you know the information? Um, if you get that through a certification, that's fine. Or if you get that through a degree, that's fine. But that's not really what I'm looking for. So I don't really have any to recommend. Um, I have heard from my neighbor, actually, who is also a data scientist at a different company, um, say that he went through the Stanford, I think it was Stanford Machine Learning or Stanford Data Science um, one year program. Um, and he got that certification. But what he really appreciated about that was the info and the knowledge and the people he got to work with during that certification, rather than um, the certification itself. So if there was one to recommend, I might recommend that one, but it's also a hard process to get into, you have to apply and get accepted. Um, but outside of that, there aren't really any that I would recommend. It's just all about knowing your stuff. Okay, okay. Um, how much important is that uh, structure in the algorithm? No, I think we covered that one already, sorry. Uh, what is the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? Ah, uh, good question. Um, so I think of machine learning as a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, it's what I, if you're trying to personify this a little bit, I think of machine learning as the brain. Um, and artificial intelligence also is a brain, but more of like a being. So a lot of times when we see robots doing things or um, picking up cans or walking or those types of things, that's what classifies more of the artificial intelligence. There's usually an agent relationship and that agent is the thing that is doing what you want it to do. Um, machine learning, this is why I say it's a subset of it because machine learning also fits in with artificial intelligence is more of the algorithms. So this would be like a classifier. Um, it could be a reinforcement learning agent, which is borderline machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, it could be a clustering algorithm. It could be anything like that, that you wouldn't picture an agent with like a classification algorithm. Yeah, you could put that in a robot and all it would do is classify things, but it's not making it walk or making it move or do anything. Um, and so those algorithms fit more into machine learning rather than artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence is usually dealing with an agent and having it make decisions and do different things. Thank you, uh, Leila. Um, what is the, uh, I guess, the uh, for you, um, and in general, if you can answer that, that question, um, uh, trying to understand what is the career path, what are the different options that someone essentially can, can do, can follow as far as a career, um, given, you know, after, you know, what, uh, what you're doing now, uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I'll just talk in general since I have already talked a little bit about my path, but I can also swing back around to that too. Um, but there's a variety of different paths you can take. If you go the PhD route, 
you can become a professor. She can with most degrees and as a PhD in machine learning. Um, you can do research for different companies, like big companies like Microsoft, Intel, Google will hire PhD researchers as part of their lab. Um, you can go give talks, you can start your own business, anything like that. Um, most people, though, if they're going for the PhD, want to be in academia or in those industry research positions. So that's one path. A second path is you can end up with your master's, and sometimes a bachelor's degree fits into this too, but usually a master's degree. You can do some research, but more often than not, you're going to end up in the machine learning engineer role, like similar to I am. And this will can involve more of a software development machine learning or deep learning role where you're literally just developing the algorithm. So it's like a software developer, but strictly for machine learning algorithms. Um, you can land in a position like mine where it's more of a problem solving position where I'm hired to come up with solutions to problems. And yes, I'll help with POC, but really I'm hired to design these solutions and put together a team to work on them as well as that entrepreneurship role. Um, so that is another type of position. And then again, making your own startups, starting your own businesses is definitely a third position that has been popular with these machine learning roles. And it's actually also something that I'm a part of too. Um, I work with a startup as a machine learning researcher um, on the side. And so that is another path that you can take um, alongside with if you can do research, but a lot of times those research roles are much harder to come by as a master's than it is a PhD, which is why most people go the PhD route if they're doing that type of career. Um, and then below that, if you are, let's say, in a different field and trying to transition into machine learning, you will often end up in that role, similar to someone with a bachelor's or master's degree, where you're doing more of that development or problem solving type of research. But if you want to do the full on um, machine learning cutting edge research with these bigger companies or even smaller companies, or you want to teach, that's when you would fully transition by going for a PhD instead of just learning it on your own. Um, there are also some entry level jobs that people can fall into, um, usually not for machine learning, it's they label it as data analyst or data science where you're filtering through data and cleaning data and helping people or you're designing tools for machine learning researchers to use in their machine learning research and that's also another option. Okay, All right, we actually just had uh, uh, data analyst uh, from Google, I think the other, the other day. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, uh, I guess another um, question about uh, some definition and I hear that one also a lot. Uh, and I think this one is also, I think a lot of people um, getting, you know, confused on not really clear on is the, the, di the difference between mesh learning and deep learning. Ah, so it's really an algorithms difference. So if you're doing deep learning is another subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. And it is a class of algorithms that use deep learning techniques. So if you have someone who's a machine learning engineer versus a deep learning engineer, more often than not, a deep learning engineer is using like deep reinforcement learning, deep convolutional neural networks, deep neural networks, deep decision trees, anything like that, where there's multiple, multiple layers and you're into that deep learning realm. Um, and you're going for accuracy, high amounts of data, all of that. Um, someone in a machine learning role may use deep learning, but that's not their primary um, algorithm of choice. So like for me, I am in a machine learning role, not a deep learning role. Some of my colleagues are in deep learning roles. Um, and I find that I'm using a lot more um, basic neural networks, optimized decision trees, reinforcement learning, um, k-means clustering, all of those types of algorithms that aren't very deep but are more simple because our data is simple. We don't have very complex data that warrants deep learning, uh, where a lot of my um, colleagues that do our deep learning engineers are dealing with massive amounts of data, whether it's in NLP, whether it's in computer vision or something, and they really need those deep learning algorithms. And that's why they're hired as a deep learning software engineer rather than a machine learning engineer. So that's really the main difference is what algorithms are you dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? And I'm assuming that from an AL to a deep learning role that uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the the bridge um, should not be that, that that difficult to. Not at all. As long as you know your deep learning algorithms, it's not a difficult bridge to cross. It's just like a different specialty that you're choosing to go into. Okay. 
Um, thank you, Leila. Question here from uh, Absor, uh, more technical question. How much of your work involves scaling your ML models in-house or in the cloud? Um, so all of, just because of my team and my project I work on, we don't do anything in the cloud and we don't scale to do anything in the cloud. All our stuff is local and that's what we try to do. Um, so I don't really actually do anything with the cloud for my project. With the startup I'm working at though, um, a lot of our work deals with trying to have these models in the cloud. So we haven't done that part yet, but I will be doing a lot of work in that realm of getting these machine learning algorithms and data sent to the cloud and back from the edge um, devices that we work with. Um, and then for my product and for my team, all our stuff is done locally. So we do all our training and data collection on each PC that our customers then um, deploy locally rather than in the cloud. Okay, follow up question from uh, Absar. I think you can, I've already touched on that, but if there is anything else that you would like to add uh, as far as skills that are needed to get roles involving end-to-end -end machine learning. So I'm not quite sure if there is really, if it really any different from what you already answered. Um, I don't think it's too different, but I think one thing I can say to hopefully help bring that around to feel like your question is answered is that end-to-end -end machine learning comes from, starts at the problem and ends with the, not really the POC, more like deploying it into the real world, but the skills that you need to do that involve really solid fundamentals of your algorithms, like we mentioned before, um, and your basics, as well as fundamental skills and understanding the domain that you're working in. So for me, that's power management and thermal management. So there's been a learning curve there. Um, it's also the entrepreneurial hat. You need to have skills in pitching skills in presenting skills in communicating ideas clearly and thoroughly um, and you need to be able to defend um, your solutions and come up with those solutions from problems that you may not know of so you know a lot of times people might think machine learning oh i'm going to be working on autonomous driving or i'm going to be working on facial recognition um, but a lot of times you might be you know, like I am in a power cycle and someone says, I need to be able to know what the ambient temperature is. And a non-machine learning engineer might say, hey, put a sensor in, that's good enough. Um, but business will come back and say, that's too expensive. A machine learning engineer might say, well, hey, we can predict this without adding any cost by doing X. So that involves not only um, domain or machine learning and knowledge, but it also involves domain knowledge and knowing how you can solve these problems within the constraints of your company. So those other skills that you would have if you're looking for that end to end is not only the machine learning fundamentals and um, the domain fundamentals, but also entrepreneurship hat of being able to pitch your ideas, defend your ideas and get people on board with you so that you can finish your product because otherwise you might have great solutions and your products will die because you can't defend them and you can't pitch them and you can't get people on board. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Leila. A uh, question here from uh, Albert, I think. Um, the, uh, so you mentioned earlier um, uh, attending conferences as a way to um, keep yourself, you know, up, mm -hmm. up to date with the, uh, with the tech uh, evolving. And, uh, but I, I think his, his question has to do with uh, more of um, jobs opportunities have you seen um have you got a lot of job opportunities from uh, from attending these conferences uh yeah so i actually haven't attended a lot of conferences um uh outside of intel just because of cost and being sponsored i have attended a few though and i have colleagues that have attended a lot and um there's usually booths there of companies that are looking to hire people in the similar interest of the conference. Um, so there's always those opportunities there. A lot of times you can network them before you go and then meet them there, or you can just meet, show them your resume, a lot of times get interviews on the spots. So jobs wise, there's that type of um, straightforward networking opportunities. But then there's also meeting people, different speakers, different people attending the conferences and getting that networking advantage that will then lead you to jobs they might have at their companies. Um, even though they're not there recruiting, they may know and can connect you with people to help you find jobs that way. Um, so job wise, there's definitely a lot of advantages to going to conferences. Not only are you meeting people, you're getting your name out there and you have the chance to meet people who do have job options for you. 
Um, and, a, and a lot of times in more casual settings than you would trying to go through a database, which is much, much harder. I actually got a Google interview that way um, through a conference. So. Right. Um, thank you, Leila. I think we're getting close to uh, the end of um, this uh, webinar, unfortunately. We'll take a few more questions and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, another question here from uh, Jean. Uh, when you are pitching your ML solutions, who are you pitching to? Is that to business people, project managers, or other ML people? Uh, more often than not, never is it other ML people, which is what makes it hard. Because yeah, it's easy for them to get on board. They see your solution, it makes sense, or they offer you know feedback. Um, more often than not, it may be pitching to my manager, his manager, program our product managers, um, product owners, um, people in different groups to try to help us find funding, um, big umbrella projects, principal engineers, senior principal engineers, fellows, um, people at different conferences that we present our paper to or demos that we show off our work to. Um, and sometimes just people that are interested in learning more about what we're doing. So huge variety, anywhere from my peers and directly above me to all the way up the management chain um, on the technical side. Thank you, Leila. Another question here. Uh, what uh, part of your job do you like the most? Um, not the, the constantly pitching to people, I can say that because while that's really fun when you've pitched the same thing 20, 30, 40 times, it gets tiring. But um, I probably my favorite part is coming up or taking these problems and coming up with solutions and getting to talk about them. That's probably easily my favorite part, as well as finding problems to solve. Um, and then yes, you get to figure out ways to frame them and then getting to build them is fun. But really that creative thinking on the theoretical side is probably my favorite part. And then um, also analyzing the data to see is, hey, is what I predicted would be a solution actually gonna work or do I have to change it? And what is the data saying to me and how can I take what it's saying to me and improve what I'm trying to do? And those are probably my favorite parts of the job. Uh, now, the other side of uh, that is what are the, uh, the challenges uh, that you often run into with, uh, with your current uh... position? Yeah, with your current role, yes. Um, politics. That is probably the hardest part of my job. Um, and it's really hard to explain or talk about until you've actually experienced it. And sometimes it's hard to believe or see until you've actually experienced it. But um, there are so many barriers with talking to people, especially being young and especially being a woman in this field, um, where I will talk to people who will not talk to me or will not work with me, but they will talk and work with someone three levels higher than me or 20 years older than me or someone else giving the same information. Um, and so, you know, having to plan my words before I actually get to say them with three or four different people, um, trying to get funding, but not getting it because they can't justify the business need themselves, even though they want our work. So essentially having to say, no, you're not getting my work for free. If you want it and we want us to continue working on this, we need funding. Um, so those I'd probably say are is really the hardest part of my job and the most challenging part of my job. Um, and it's also really heartbreaking because you might have a solution that's really going to help a lot of people and a lot of people want, but no one's willing to sponsor. So you are not allowed to work on it. Um, that's probably one of the hardest parts of my job. But if you can get around that, then you can do some really great things. Thank you, Leila. Uh, last question, and then we'll wrap things up. The, uh, is there, uh, okay, let's actually take one more question here from Albert. Did you have to negotiate a fair salary benefit before accepting the position or is that a bad idea? No, you should do that for any position, machine learning or not, definitely negotiate and no, do your research before you go in. I actually, um, with my position, negotiated really hard on it. Um, and accepted a salary that I knew would be paying me less than other places because of the fact that, A, I wanted to work with this team. I knew I was in a unique position and um, 
I was okay accepting a lower salary given some other perks and some other be benefits and knowing who I was working with. Um, and But I also did a lot of hard negotiating before that and ended up with a better offer than I was previously given. Um, and I so the moral of that story is no matter what position you're in, machine learning, software development, business, finance, uh, chemistry, I don't know, any position you're in, always negotiate is never a bad idea. And really just keep in mind that the HR person you're talking to is trying to um, give you the lowest value that they can while making you feel like you're getting the best value. Um, which means that if you take their first offer, they're ecstatic because that was what they're willing to offer you and you're excited and you're taking it and they don't have to give you more, even though they have a buffer to give you more. Um, if you negotiate uh, more often than not, you will get more than your negotiated salary. I even have a friend that we were looking at jobs at the same time. She also got an offer at Intel as a software developer and got a pretty good first offer and went to her manager and said, you know, I'm happy I'm going to accept this offer because I want to work at the team, but I know I'm supposed to negotiate just based off of what I've been told. Is there anything you can do for me? And he kind of smiled and said, hold on. And because of that, that small conversation, um, she was able to get a $20,000 sign-on bonus, which she didn't have before. She Her salary got upped and um, she had a couple other perks that were really helpful for her, even though she, she was happy with what she had before, just that concept of negotiation was able to get her a lot more okay, so always Thank negotiate mm -hmm. one more question and then i promise this will be it so can uh from jane can ml engineers be independent contributors and or remote workers somewhat yeah. removed from politics and more focused on ml solutions Yes, they can. Um, again, it just depends on the company you're working for and the job that you have. In my position, I can't be because I am the only person and I need to be available during the hours of my team. That's just the culture of my team and the culture of where I work and what I do. But it is definitely possible to work remote or kind of be away from those things. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Leila. So I think we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, let me just share my screen again and we'll wrap things up. Um, any uh, last uh, thought, uh, Leila, before uh, I, I start sharing my presentation? Um, I don't think I have anything more other than if you're excited um, and you're passionate about machine learning, um, just keep trying and you'll find something. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.